Behind our pub. Good afternoon, everyone. And many thanks for joining my talk today. I gave a verse of this talk last autumn to celebrate my 30th year at the library and to reflect on the experiences over the last 30 years. I didn't realise, of course, at the time that my 31st year at the library was going to be one of the most challenging and most memorable. As you can see from the opening slide, my hair used to be very long and curly, and you can see that it's getting that way now. I'd just like to give you a quick housekeeping message. Um, my Wi-Fi can sometimes be a bit unstable, and uh, it normally resumes pretty quickly, but if it fails, uh, the host will take over. And also, if you have any questions, you're very welcome to use the question and answer facility on Zoom. So I can hardly believe that it's been over 30 years since I first set eyes on the beautiful building which graces the Aberystwyth skyline and faces Cardigan Bay. I came to Aberystwyth to undertake the archive administration course at the library and following a very enjoyable year at Carmarthen Archives, I gained a position at the National Library of Wales. The library was founded in 1907 with a mission to collect, preserve and provide access to Wales' documentation documentary heritage. It is the National Legal Deposit Library of Wales with the rights to copy of all every pu publication printed in Britain and Ireland and is one holds over 6.5 million books and periodicals and the largest collections of archives, portraits, maps and photographic images in Wales. It is also home to the National Collection of Welsh Manuscripts, the Screen and Sound Archive and the most comprehensive collection of paintings and topographical prints in Wales. Welsh is the library's main medium of communication and my fledgling skills in the language will soon be improved within that very supportive environment. During the course of the last 30 years, I have witnessed fundamental change, but also continuity. The library has always been a place of learning, holding wonderful collections, cared for by knowledgeable staff who preserve and provide access to these collections. 30 years ago, the access was dependent upon visiting the library, ordering material and waiting in the reading rooms for its arrival. Now more than a million people are able to access the library's collections without physically coming to the library every year. Archivists promote the archives and their use by protecting and providing access to collections and enabling collections to be made between them and making new inter interpretations. They are also gatekeepers for the truth. In the age of deep fake, when computer generation images can appear to make anyone say anything and fake news where facts and evidence can be easily ignored if they get in the way of a good story or are considered to be inconvenient, such as the claim of the White House in 2017 that President Trump had the biggest audience ever to witness an inauguration, inauguration though photographs and videos contradicted this claim. The role of the archives is to preserve the truth and counter the untruths. However, in the digital age, it can be very difficult to differentiate fact from fiction and it's easy to manipulate images and content. So one of the challenges is to maintain the authenticity and reliability and truth of digital content over time. So the archivist provides, preserves and protects. Definite affirmations for my career choice. I started the library in October 1989 as an assistant archivist in the then manuscripts and records section. My first task was to catalogue a collection of deeds related to the Manly, Manly family of Overstock. I was presented with a pile of parchment documents and told to catalogue them. I can remember how amazed I was to find one of the deeds actually mentioned Owen Glendore, and I really felt that I was handling history. After recording information, which I have now learned to call metadata, such as name, place, date, subject and description on index cards, these cards would then be piped, typed up by the secretaries and put in bound volumes and placed in the manuscript reading room. Researchers would then consult the catalogue and order the physical copies. In 1991, however, there was a significant change to the way things were done. Word processes were introduced to the library and I can remember being taught how to save, change and edit my work. The word processes were basically used as typewriters so that we can now type out our own work instead of sending them to the secretaries. However, the next significant change was also in 1991, when the library implemented the International Standard for Archival Cataloguing and Description, known as ISAD-G. 
This standard enables archives to be understood within their particular context, as parts of archival collections have connections to each other, which is expressed as a hierarchy of context and relationships. This way of cataloguing is common use as it provides a standard format for data to be structured and to be shared. A search of the Manley family on the Archives Hub, which is a union catalogue for archives, shows that there is a related connection in Bangor University Archives. Following the Dees collection, I was then set loose on other collections that included estate records, religious records, local government records, corporate and personal papers. I learned a number of things about being an archivist, which you are not taught on the year long course, including the need to show empathy and sensitivity when refusing or discussing an item of great personal value, to coping with one's own emotional responses when cataloguing collections, some of which can be very distressing. I am going to talk about three collections in particular, the Emlyn Williams papers, the Cardiff Opera House Trust archive, and the Cuffin Williams collection. I've selected these, not just because of their fascinating content, but because they illustrate different issues that occur in collections management. Emlyn Williams was an internationally famous author, playwright and actor. He was born in 1905 in Flintshire and went on to have a very successful career and a multitude of friends in the theatrical world, including Noel Coward, John Gielgud and Sybil Thorndike. He was a mentor to Richard Burton and gave him his first professional role in the Druid's Rest. He chronicled every aspect of his life and I'm sure he would have been a very avid social media user. And this was documented in enormous scrapbooks full of correspondence, playbills, press cuttings and photographs, which provide a vivid picture of the theatrical world of the time. He was also very interested in the study of evil and wrote several plays on the subject. In 1966, he attended every day of the trial of the Moors murderers and published a book entitled Beyond Belief, A Chronicle of Murder and Its Detection. As part of the research for this book, he collected original material relating to Ian Brady and Myra Hindley. I found this material was distressing to handle and I asked my boss at the time what to do and he advised me that embargo should be placed on the items, which was following usual library practice at the time. However, in 2000, the FOI Act was brought in, Freedom of Information, with the aim of making publicly held information more transparent and open. As a public organisation which holds information, we could no longer place embargoes on collections, but any closures had to conform with exemptions outlined in the Act. Following the Act, a systematic survey was undertaken of all the embargoed collections and exemptions were applied when necessary. Material relating to the murders, was closed under section 38 of the Act, which meant the disclosure of which was likely to endanger the physical or mental health or the safety of any individual. The Cardiff Opera House Trust. This archival collection demonstrates the drama and passion which can be found in what appears to be mundane board minutes and correspondence. The archive reflects the evidentiary nature of archives. The minutes, correspondence and paper bear witness to the shenanigans of the press and the political infighting of the time. As you remember, may remember, in 1990, the Cardiff Bay Development Corporation secured Welsh Office funding to investigate the feasibility of building an arts centre in the Bay. In 1992, a design brief for the building was published, 269 submissions were returned, and these were reduced to four shortlisted and four invited architects. Following the competition, the winner was declared to be Zaha Hadid, and to a striking design of a beautiful transparent necklace of glass-fronted public spaces was shown on Harlech TV shortly afterwards, along with the designs of the runners-up. Viewers were asked to vote with their phones. 88.5% were against Hadid and the Opera House. The local press also took up the story with a vengeance, so much so that the Cardiff Bay Opera House Trust decided not to commission her, but asked her to resubmit her design for a further um, appraisal. She won again. But even with that, the final decision of the Millennium Commission was to refuse funding for the Opera House. According to a letter written to Adrian Ellis from Jennifer Page of the Millennium Commission, it was decided that the commissioners unanimously decided that on the grounds of value for money and the technical business and financial uncertainties, they could not support the building. Here you can see the library holds a huge model of proposed Opera House Trust, which is a very significant item, but weighing is about half a ton, 
is not easily accessible, but it's a beautiful item and it's very significant for our collection. Catherine Williams. On his death in September 2006, Catherine Williams bequeathed a large part of his estate to the library. The bequest comprised works on paper, oil paintings, and original prints, depicting the landscape and people of Wales, as well as an archive consisting of correspondence, diaries, and manuscripts, and a large group of photographs and slides. The collection presented a number of challenges and raised a number of issues. And I want to talk about three issues in particular, which relate to access. The first being access log. The collection included works in different formats, as I said, a paper archive, a collection of oil paintings, and works on paintings, ceramics, and other items, which were all accessed through different mediums and means. In 2005, the new library system by Ex Libris was implemented with the ability to provide integrated access to all items in all formats. A search for Catherine Williams lists nine format types with the ability to view the archival material within its archival context through linkage with the Atom cataloging system. This provides the best of both worlds, the ability to see everything in all formats, but not to lose the archival integrity of the archival material. A second um, issue raised by the Kefin collection relates to the ethics of access. The collection includes a number of pictures which were deliberately damaged Cuffin, presumably because he was not happy with them. However, when Terry Cratchit died, he ensured that his works could no longer be seen by having them destroyed by a steamroller, whereas Cuffin put a hole in them and moved them to his basement. Now the question was, should the library make these available for research as they are of potential interest, or not, as the artist obviously was not happy with them? This issue is representative of the types of questions which pertain to the application of professional ethics to managing collections and collection management. A third issue relating to the Catherine Williams collection relates to physical access, storage and heroic star. The collection had been stored in an area at the time which was, did not provide easy access, nor were the environmental conditions ideal for the collection. In 2007, the library opened a new sixth floor storage area within a converted courtyard, which it shares with the Royal Commission on Ancient Historic Monuments for Wales. This provides a state-of-the-art storage facility for differing format types. And as you can see, I'm very fond of the sexy shelving. This is the only electronic shelving we have in the library. So one floor of this building was specifically designed to hold the Catherine Williams collection as you can see, with racks for paintings and cubby holes for the three-dimensional works. A plan for moving the collection was devised, which was estimated to take between three and six months with groups of staff working together. However, on the 17th of November 2016, Aberystwyth experienced a freak tornado which lasted 10 minutes, with 94 mile per hour winds which badly damaged, damaged the storage area which was holding the Catherine William collection at the time. I was in Cardiff at the time, but came back the next day to the knowledge that library staff had worked together and moved the whole collection to the new storage area within a space of a day and a half, which was an amazing achievement. I've mentioned the ways in which cataloguing has developed in response to providing better access to collections, but access in all its forms has always been important to the library. In 1999, on the cusp of the new millennium and within the context of the establishment of the National Assembly for Wales, which was now responsible for funding the library, the library undertook an extensive consultation exercise called Choosing the Future to discover if it was effectively serving scholarship, learning and the community. The consultation exercise responses confirmed that there was warm public support for the work of the library and provided, of course, suggestions for future improvements. A focus was placed on widening access to wider groups of users and to more users through opening up the building, developing education services and digitisation. The visitor experience was a key element of the library's plans to increase physical access to the library. With funding from the Heritage Lottery Fund resulted in new entrance, which provided access to visitors with mobility issues, the room for multimedia presentations, the education room, the restaurant and the shop. 
The new exhibition area, which sits on Tofford Room, was also opened at this time, enabling the library to exert its treasures in an environmentally controlled space. A digitization unit was also established to provide a full service dealing with all aspects of the creation of digital content, selection, digitization, rights clearance and storage. One of the first collections to be digitized was the framed work of art collection comprising four and a half thousand items including paintings, drawings and photographs. The variety in the collection is amazing. It contains the superb paintings of martyrs such as Turner, Richard Wilson, Gainsborough, Paul Sandby and James Ward, in addition to works reflecting the native Welsh artistic tradition such as William Booth, Hugh Hughes and the Reverend Evan Williams. It also of course has the modern masters including Sir Puffin Williams, Will Roberts and Evan Walters. From 2008 onwards mass digitisation became a priority with the digitisation of journals, newspapers and tithe maps which was facilitated through external funding. This mass digitisation enabled the creation of a vast research resource allowing access to over 450 journal titles and over 1.5 million newspaper articles. Support for education was another strand of the access policy. A new education and learning strategy was developed to actively engage with learners of all ages. This was a very successful strategy which continues to deliver innovative and exciting ways of learning from engaging with the collections. And this is my daughter and her friend in the very popular Cuffey Williams escape room. She's still there as well. In order to deliver the changes following Choosing the Future, the library's organisational structure was uh, changed. When I started in 1989, the structure consisted of three departments, reflecting the published, non-published and graphical formats, supported by an administration section. In 2001, a new structure was established, which was designed to deliver the access strategy. This resulted in the Department of Manuscripts and Records, Department of Pictures and Maps, and Department of Printed Books being replaced with a new structure to provide effective and integrated services. I was moved rather reluctantly, it has to be said, from the old archives and manuscripts section to be part of the new system section. I was assured that it would be a great opportunity, but was somewhat trepidatious to be leaving the comparative safe world of archives and entering the unknown world of systems. We were a very small section, but with a very big job, as we had to lead on the implementation of a new system which would replace existing system for managing published materials and the system for managing archive materials. After a lot of appraisal, the VTLS virtuous system was selected, which had been originally developed for published material. So we had to work with the company to develop a system which would enable archival hierarchical cataloguing. Everything connected with the VTLS system began with a V, so virtue for cataloguing, vital for the management of digital assets. And I wanted to call the archival cataloguing system, which we developed in collaboration with VTLS, Vellum. But sadly, it never caught on and VTLS itself was bought by another company in 2004. So I've touched on technological change as it relates to hardware and, soft and systems, but there has also been an enormous challenge to those who are charged with preserving and providing access to content, which is now being created almost entirely digitally. The preservation of digital information poses a significant challenge to archivists, as unlike archives in paper or parchment, which can be read by the human eye many years after creation, digital records consist of binary numbers and rely on machines for interpretation. The fast change in technology may mean that material, which was only created a few years ago, may not be easily accessible today. The explosion in the growth of digital content has meant that collections that we used to sort, catalogue, preserve in storage areas and make available in the reading rooms need a fundamental change in approach. Archivists are actively engaging in the challenge to preserve and provide access to information which is now being produced by personal computers, iPads, mobile devices, and these will be the historical record of the future. It is, however, difficult to determine provenance and original order when you are dealing with text messages from phones, tweets and email. The application of data protection principles can be difficult with a host of emails and digital information is easy to change, easy to manipulate and very easy to lose contextual information. 
Retrieving data, which has been created on obsolete formats, is a very expensive and resource dependent task. It is much preferable to ensure that data does not become obsolete and accessible in the first place by ensuring that the data and technology are accessible through time. Migration strategies, which mean moving data from one format to the next one, are being developed, which will ensure that data is always moved with the next generation of technology, regardless of the technology which was used to create it originally. The Library has been working with the Archives and Records Association and with support from the Welsh Government to develop a policy and technical infrastructure to ensure the long-term preservation of the digital heritage. In 2010, I was appointed as head of the collections care section with responsibility for conservation of physical and digital collections, as well as collection support and storage. Despite the increase in digital content, the library's collections in all formats continue to grow. And with over 80,000 legal deposit items being added every year, it is an ongoing challenge for the collection support section to find space to store the collections appropriately. The preservation of the collections has been seen as a priority since the library's foundation. The skills of conservators were demonstrated in the conservation work which was undertaken on the Boston manuscript, which was purchased by the library with the support from the HLF and others in 2012. The creation of beautiful facsimiles of the manuscripts, which are hardly distinguishable from the originals, not only demonstrated the skills of the conservators, but also enabled the manuscripts to be used for outreach and educational activities. And you can see how dexterous the conservators are because they have three hands, you can see there. And there they are making um, copies of the manuscripts that could be used for outreach and educational purposes. Um, on the top right, you can see the three facsimiles and it's almost impossible to tell which is the original. One of my greatest disappointments over the last 30 years was the failure um, to convince the Heritage Lottery Fund to um, fund a new conservation centre for physical and digital material. However, the recent grant by the National Heritage Lottery Fund, which will enable the library to develop a national broadcast archive for Wales and provide access to and preserve the amazing wealth of radio and television broadcast material, which has been accumulated since the 1930s, almost makes up for this. This is a tremendous documentary record of Wales and its people, and it includes records of World War II, Aberfan, the minor strike and devolution. Engagement and inclusion is intrinsic to the work of the archive. And if a picture paints a thousand words, a film clip paints a million. So this one will run. And it is a very good morning in Wales. Yeah. I do want all of you down to go. I'm coming to Jesse to be meet Arno. I mean, more than sick here. I get tired. He may well get there. And he has. And if you are here on the joint. The library is also working in partnership with the British Film Institute on a project called Unlocking Film Heritage, which ensures that the UK screen heritage UK sound heritage is safeguarded and made available for the BFI player. It's all, sorry, it's also working with the BL to preserve the UK sound heritage and to save our sounds. This project is prioritising fragile sound materials, which include a wealth of information, such as this advice given by E.D. Bowen. Oops, sorry, 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 sorry. I'll get it right this time. No, I won't get it right. Uh, there we are. Sorry. <laughs> In our in modern times, it is still considered very unlucky to carry a white stone, small though it may be, in your pocket. Very unlucky. A very widespread superstition. Or accidentally, if a pebble gets into a shoe, 
or into a sandal on the beach there. Uh, you'll find that uh, if it's a white court, piece of white cord stone, then you're considered to be very bad luck indeed. To follow. And one man told me within the last 12 months that he found a piece of white cord stones lodged in his tire of his car in this mechanical age. And he said, I took, he took the tire off actually. I could give you his name and address. You know, he picks up stones at the time he picks a go in, you see. So just uh, just keep that advice in mind if you're ever walking on the beach. So staying with the theme of audiovisual material, the library holds over six million feet of film dating from the beginning of the 20th century, reflecting all aspects of Welsh life. And one of the most significant films that's held is the 1918 biopic of David Lloyd George, which was directed by Morris Elvey and was thought to have been destroyed before its release. But it was found and restored by the film and signed archive. The restoration project took two years to complete and was a triumph in film restoration. In 2011, the film was recognised by UNESCO Committee of the UK Memory of the World and inscribed on the UK Register of Documentary Heritage. These include items, we have now four items on the list, and these include items from our outstanding maps and manuscripts collection. I cannot talk about the last 30 years without mentioning the events of 26th of April 2013. The fire alarms had been going off quite often um, in the library for a couple of weeks beforehand as we had been having some work done on the roof. On exiting the building on that day, one of my colleagues pointed to the roof and we saw fire and smoke raging across the room of the top of the second library building. There were lots of lessons that we got from the fire, which we shared, including the amount of damage that can be caused by the water which was used to put out the fire and the value of packaging protection and the value of fire doors. But one of the lessons that I remember was the knowledge of how much the library means to local people. We had run out of plastic to protect the collections. We, the water was coming through everywhere and we were putting um, plastic all across them and we'd run out completely. And one of my colleagues offered to go out and forage for plastic for me. She went to a local farm and the farmer said to her, well, I'll never give you any books for the library, but I can certainly spare you some plastic to protect the ones you have. We were very grateful. Although unfortunately some items were destroyed, the library was very sensitive in the way it communicated with stakeholders and received lots of support for the way in which it responded to the fire and its aftermath and it restored and repaired many of the items that had been um, damaged by the fire. So I can remember many other significant and memorable, if not as traumatic events um, that happened over the last 30 years, including the anniversary of the library in 2001, when the library was engulfed in a huge hug, the coming of the Olympic torch in 2012, the construction of the amazing curved wall for the digitization of tithe maps for the Canebu project in 2014, the first ever Wikipedia, Wikipedia in residence in 2015, and the co-location of our friends at the Royal Commission on Historic Monuments of Wales in 2016. And now I think I can add 2020 as another year of significance and trauma. It has been a privilege to work with the wonderful collections in this beautiful building, surrounded by fantastic colleagues who are coping amazingly well during this difficult period. The library is continuing to collect, make available and care for its collections during this time, of course, in old and new ways. It is actively collecting to preserve an archive of Wales's COVID experience. And if you would like to share your experiences on that, the details are available on the website. So thank you for listening. Dukumai Amrando and keep safe. Thank you. And if you have any questions, uh, please let me know.